Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for being with us. It's today another uh, webinar from the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology, and uh, which is dedicated to a fantastic topic, which is the new approach to ovarian stimulation for in vitro fertilization. Today, we have two speakers, Professor Basil Tarlassis from Thessaloniki and Professor Juan Garcia Velasco from Madrid, Spain. I will introduce uh, first Professor Basil Tarlassis and then Professor Juan Garcia Velasco. Professor Basil Tarlassis is, uh, as you know, is Professor Emeritus in Obstetric Gynecology and Reproductive Medicine in the Medical School of the University of Thessaloniki in Greece and is President of the European Board and College of Obstetric Gynecology and editorial member of 14 international and seven Greek journals. Is a co editor of five books, member of international uh, and uh, 20, uh, 18 international and 24 Greek societies, and mostly is member of the board of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. Basil, you have the microphone and you can make your talk. After you, I will uh, introduce uh, Professor Garcia Velasco. And at the end, we will have the general discussion. Thank you very much. Please. It's a great pleasure to. Uh join uh, the, uh, this webinar from the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. And indeed, we are going to discuss uh, some uh, new uh, aspects, new developments in the uh, innovative stimulation for IVF. So I think I should share screen now. So my, the, the topic of my talk will be is uh, what is the most effective protocol for suppressing LH surges during ovarian stimulation? These are my possible disclosures, but none is related to the topic that I'm going to discuss with you today. And these are the learning objectives. So first we discuss about premature uh, late surges in the context of ovarian stimulation and how can we suppress the, uh, the late surges, uh, GnRH agonists, long protocol, GnRH antagonists and progestogens and progesterone. So we all know that uh, in 1978, Louis Brown was born uh, in the natural cycle because the pioneers, Bob Edwards and, and Patrick Steptoe, were convinced, especially since the first pregnancy they had was um, with stimulation was an ectopic, that the natural, the natural cycle was the way to go. Obviously at that time, this was not that simple because they had to monitor urinary LH with high gonavis, and, uh, and then whenever the LH, uh, uh, they detected an LH rise, then they should calculate when to do the ovum collection, uh, which could take place day, night, whenever. And it was done by laparoscopy, and uh, an oocyte was collected, fertilized, cleaved, and was transferred at the eight cell stage in the night because they wanted to follow the biorhythms. Uh, however, the game changer was uh, this uh, paper from, uh, from the uh, Melbourne group. So Alan Trounson and his colleagues published in Science 1981, where they used some type of ovarian stimulation, clomiphene or clomiphene plus HMG at the time, uh, in order to get more oocytes. And this was proven to be very effective because it improved the success rate, the achievement of pregnancy, which with a natural cycle was quite problematic. And so they reported that with the so-called at the time controlled ovulatory cycle, uh, they could get very good results. However, it soon became evident that in some of these cycles uh, stimulated, there was an LH uh, uh, surge rise, which uh, led to cycle cancellation. And Ernst Lumet had calculated that this occurs in approximately 20% of the cycles. So it became evident that we needed some uh, mean to suppress the LH surges. And the first protocol that was used uh, is the long GnRH agonist protocol. Uh, this is the first paper where this protocol was described by uh, Ian Kraft, Porter, uh, uh, and others. Uh, and it was published in The Lancet, uh, as you can see here in 1984, 
and uh, and it was the group of Howard Jacobs. So as we know, a uh, GnRH agonist, when given, first stimulates the secretion of FSH and LH because it's an agonistic uh, analog. And uh, but if we continue uh, administering uh, the, the analog, then it the, suppresses the hypothesis and therefore can control an LH surge. So the protocol is to start on day one of the cycle or day 21 of the preceding cycle, start with a GnRH agonistic analog and give it for at least 10 or four to 14 days. When suppression is ensured, then FSH HMG stimulation starts and then we can have the um, uh, oocyte pickup and transfer. And these are the first papers where this protocol, the use of this protocol was reported. And, and then after some uh, uh, experience, there were, this is one of the first meta-analysis, sorry, uh, the first meta-analysis by Hughes and colleagues published in Fertility in 1992, where they compared conventional uh, uh, stimulation protocol with clomiphene HMG or HMG alone versus the use of GnRH agonistic analog. And as we can see, using the long agonist protocol, the, uh, uh, the pregnancy rate was significantly higher, almost two times uh, higher than with the conventional protocols. So GnRH uh, long protocol became the kind of a, a gold uh, standard. Uh, but it was not so, uh, it was not without some complications. So we know because of the stimul original stimulation, uh, a, a follicle uh, could, or a corpus luteum could be stimulated and then we could have a cyst formation. Uh, as it appeared, there is a higher incidence of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Then with a prolonged administration, there were estrogen deprivation symptoms. It was quite lengthy, not so very patient friendly. And obviously it was a kind of an irrational thing. So we first stimulate uh, FSH and LH secretion and then we suppress it. So uh, the second option which became possible later was the development of GnRH antagonists. The, uh, the uh, antagonists initially were abandoned because of uh, uh, allergic reactions. However, the third generation antagonists uh, were devoid of these allergic reactions. And it was shown that they are quite, uh, quite uh, efficient and uh, the protocol is much shorter. So in this case, we start uh, ovarian stimulation with RECFSH or HMG, whatever, on day two or three of, this, of the menses. And then on day four, five, six, we start administering the GnRH antagonist, which has the big advantage that it immediately suppresses LH because it competes uh, at the level of the receptor. So you don't need to do a desensitization like with the long agonist protocol. There is a, a immediate suppression of LH uh, surges. And then of course, uh, the usual uh, procedure or site pickup and, and transfer. And <clears throat> this is a, a recent meta-analysis comparing uh, agonists and antagonists. And as we can see here, there is practically no, uh, no significant difference between the two. Now, the question is therefore, whether there are LH rises during before or during uh, antagonist and agonist administration? And the answer is yes. So by Oliven, these are studies uh, that, um, that were done, big studies uh, on the uh, use of the antagonist and the agonist. So we can see here that with the antagonist and before starting the, uh, the, before starting the antagonist administration, there were 14% uh, spontaneous LH arises. And uh, as we can see here, uh, with the uh, agonist administration, there was 2.3. So there is, in both cases, uh, higher a bit in uh, antagonists before we give them. 
after we give them, as we can see, then it, it, it's uh, um, minimized. So here we can see that in uh, uh, women with premature LHRI, patients with uh, LHRI, in the fixed antagonist protocol was 15% and with flexible 11%. So fixed and flexible means that in, in the fixed protocol, we start the antagonist on a given date, usually it's day five of stimulation. Whereas in the flexible, we follow and we start the antagonist when the, when the follicle is greater than 11 or 12 millimeters and E2 is about 200 or so uh, uh, pico picograms per milliliter. So in principle, uh, studies that we have done with uh, uh, Professor Kolibianakis and uh, Professor Griesinger, it seems that the fixed uh, is associated with higher uh, pregnancy rate as compared to the flexible. So, uh, we talked about agonists long and antagonists, and then came the progesterone. Now, this is an interesting report that we uh, uh, published uh, in uh, 1987 in the Green Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Uh, at that time, I was working in Yale with Andrew Cherney and uh, Mike Diamond. So we stimulated a woman and we could get all sites. However, we discovered that the woman was pregnant. So ovarian stimulation took place while she was pregnant. And we could get all sites that could get fertilized. But of course, as the pregnancy was progressing, we saw that there was a pregnancy in the uterus and we stopped there. That is the first report showing that even in the luteal phase, we can have ovarian stimulation and oocyte pickup. And this was subsequently confirmed by several studies, recent studies, indicating that there are at least two waves of follicle development within the cycle. And as we can see here, this is the first wave, and then uh, starts a second wave. Uh, and, and, and we can see here also that it, sometimes there is a third wave as well. And this, of course, gave the idea that we could use in a given cycle these two waves, and that would be the uh, topic of uh, the next speaker, uh, Professor Velasco, about with the, using the dual steam. Sorry. Now, progestins uh, are used to suppress alleged surges uh, because they do. The use of the protocol implies that we have to freeze all embryos because the endometrium is disturbed with this uh, administration of progestins and transfer should be done in a subsequent cycle after endometrial uh, preparation. Now, according to the uh, ESHRAE guidelines, the use of progestins for LH peak suppression is still uh, conditional uh, uh, and if applied can only be used in the context of non-transfer uh, cycles. This is the protocol uh, as has been described by Lamarca and Capucho. And as we can see here, the, you, uh, we can start the, um, uh, the progestins, uh, 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 the stimulation, and then we can start progestins to suppress LH uh, surge, or it could be done uh, concomitantly progestins plus ovarian uh, stimulation. And these are uh, different uh, meta-analyses, uh, different uh, studies, sorry, uh, using progestins for suppressing LH surge, so that Chen is quasi-randomized. Uh, we see that the life birth rate is 8.3%, whereas in the natural cycle, 39 And we, they could get, uh, you know, 1.09, one oocyte versus a little less than that. Uh, Hamdi and, and colleagues, that was a prospective controlled trial. So the clinical pregnancy rate was 23% with progestins and 27% with antagonists. Uh, and so no significant difference and no difference in the number of uh, all sites retrieved, 9.95, 10, let's say, versus 10, not significant. And then the third study, I'm sorry. And then the third study by Kwang and colleagues, 256 prospective control trial with the uh, progestins, the life birth rate, 43%, 
uh, with um, natural cycle uh, with short sorry with short GnRH agonist 35.5 and the number of uh, oocytes uh, similar. And these are the systematic reviews. So by Alessandro with uh, seven uh, seven studies included. Uh, Tsolfa Roli, four, uh, Kai, 16, Ata, 22, which is the biggest, and Kui, 11. And here we can see from Alexandru, uh, progestins versus GnRH antagonists, and the endpoint was live birth slash ongoing pregnancy rate. And as you can see, there was practically no difference in live birth rate, which is the upper panel, uh, or live birth, or uh, ongoing pregnancy rate here and overall no significant difference as we can see the diamond is crossing the uh, unity line. Then another uh, from the same uh, uh, meta-analysis, it was progestins versus GnRH agonists in the long protocol. Again, live birth, ongoing pregnancy rate. And interestingly enough, of, of course, there are not so many studies, not so many patients, uh, the, it, it was favoring uh, progestins. As we can see here, the, uh, the uh, odds ratio was 1.49, and, and it is not crossing the unity line, favoring, uh, uh, favoring um, uh, uh, progestins. So um, then we go uh, to the uh, other meta-analysis, looking at the, um, the impact of the, uh, sorry, again. Okay, so we can see here that the uh, in the in the uh, baby outcomes, and as we can see here again, there is absolutely no difference, no impact on the uh, uh, no impact on the babies uh, from uh, the use of progestins, and uh, and uh, also we looked at the other, they looked at the other outcomes, and again we can see that progestin derivatives or progestins uh, per se there was absolutely no difference between uh, the use of uh, progestins or, uh, okay. Con concerning congenital mal malformation, again, both in singleton and twins, again, there is no difference in, con in the incidence of congenital malformations uh, when using the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, progestins as compared to GnRH agonists. Low birth weight, again, there is no difference between progestins and GnRH agonists, as you can see here. Preterm birth, no difference, just a second. Uh, no difference, as we can see here, since the diamond even marginally crosses the unity line. Then we have the, uh, the um, progestins in poor ovarian responders. And as we can see here, there is no difference, although in the total, in, uh, they compared the, uh, the, the progestins versus minimal stimulation IVF, progestins versus antagonist protocol, as you can see here, no difference. Uh, short GnRH, uh, progestins versus short GnRH agonist protocol, no difference, but only one study. Uh, progestins versus ultra short GnRH agonist, again, no, diff no significant difference. Although overall there is a slight, uh, a slight um, a higher odds ratio for uh, for uh, favoring the GnRH agonist as compared to progestins. So here it is. The uh, uh, so we look at the different. Uh, let me see here in in poor responders and overall concerning can uh, cancer. Uh, cycle cancellation, I'm sorry, there was no difference. M2s uh, was a, a small difference, but although significant, clinically not very significant. Embryos the same and high quality embryos uh, the same. Uh, concerning life birth weight, there was no significant difference uh, in the neither in the RCTs nor in the non-RCTs, as we can see here, it is absolutely no difference between the uh, between uh, progestins and the uh, analogs. And concerning the incidence of OHSS, 
interestingly enough, but again, only in two studies with few cases, uh, the incidence of OHSS was lower in the progestins as compared to the uh, use of the agonists. Concerning the duration of stimulation, uh, the duration of stimulation was no difference. As you can see, it was absolutely the same, uh, both in the uh, RCTs and the non-RCTs. Then if we look at the dose of gonadotropins, uh, again, there was a trend, uh, although not significant, a trend to favor the progestins, that means to use less gonadotropins. But this, as I said, it's a small uh, sample, only one study here and there. And therefore we cannot really uh, say that there is a difference. Although at the end, as you can see here, but that includes few and non-randomized studies, uh, the, this seems to favor the, uh, the, to favor the control, them. that means the agonists as compared to the uh, progestins. Number of uh, COCs, again, there is absolutely no difference as we can see here in the upper panel. And the uh, M2O sites, again, no difference between, uh, between progestins and the uh, agonists. Number of embryos, in this particular case, it seems that it favors the progestins. But again, differences are not uh, that big and the number of studies and number of patients is not that high. So we would say that there is no difference, maybe a little more embryos in the uh, progestin uh, suppressed uh, uh, protocols. Uh, now we can look at the uh, ovarian stimulation by meta-analysis by ATA. And as we can see here, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm sorry for that. Uh, so the duration of stimulation, as we can see, no difference. Gonadotropin uh, dose, no uh, difference. Uh, COCs, no difference. Diamond is just on the unit, on the line. And, and number of M2s, again, no uh, difference. So then we go move on. Uh, so again, progestins versus the antagonist, probability of pregnancy, life birth rate, no uh, difference, one study. Life birth rate per embryo transfer, no difference, two studies. Life birth rate per oocyte pickup, again, Four studies, no difference. Um, life birth rate, uh, 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 embryo transfer recipients, again, no difference. Cumulate uh, uh, clinical pregnancy rate, no difference. And then we have five studies in a thousand <laughs> patients. Cumulative pregnancy, uh, pregnancy rate, um, as we can see here per, uh, per recipients, again, no difference. Uh, miscarriage, no difference, multiple pregnancy, no difference, and multiple pregnancy per woman with ET, no difference. Then if we look at the duration of stimulation, there is no uh, difference. The gonadotropin dose, progestins, here the comparison is between progestins and agonists. Before it was progestins antagonists. So progestins and agonists, so uh, we can see that there is no difference in duration of stimulation, no difference in the gonadotrophin use, number of COCs, no significant difference, and M2s, again, no significant difference. Now, yeah, another, another progesterone is medroxyprogesterone acetate uh, versus the <coughs> hydrogesterone, which is dufastone, uh, in ovarian stimulation, so we can see no difference in duration of stimulation, no difference in the total gonadotropin use, no difference in number of oocytes, and no difference in the uh, number of metaphase uh, to oocytes. Uh, again, comparing these two products in the probability of pregnancy, clinical pregnancy per embryo transfer, there is no difference. Miscarriage rate, miscarriage rate per pregnancy, no difference. And multiple pregnancy rate, 
again, absolutely no uh, difference. Also, another product has been tried, which is eutrogestin, natural micronized progesterone <clears throat> versus the antagonist. And as we can see here, it works as well. And actually, uh, we can see here that uh, it, it has uh, a number of follicles seem to be higher, but again, uh, and the number of mature oocytes, the retrieved oocytes all favor uh, the use of eutrogestin, number of M2 oocytes, they're significantly higher, the number of uh, embryos, the ovul ovulation cycles, and the endometrial thickness. So there is, and the positive pregnancy, uh, no difference, but uh, pretty high in both cases. So you, one can use eutrogestin to suppress LH surges instead of GnRH antagonist. And then if we think a little bit beyond the GnRH analogs, we can see that uh, we could perhaps see whether we could start the stimulation utilizing the endogenous progesterone rise. So the initiation of ovarian stimulation could start, <clears throat> could be in the late follicular phase using FSH alone without ex exogenous pituitary modulators for LH suppression. And as we can see here, this indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, does work. And we can see here that these uh, uh, progesterone rise with a red and concomitantly there is a, an LH suppression. So endogenous progesterone produced in the luteal phase can suppress LH and therefore that's actually why we need to, uh, we need to um, substitute the uh, luteal phase also because the LH goes down due to estrogen and progesterone. And these are the uh, results by Zhu and Fu. So the duration of stimulation with a late stimulation uh, uh, is a bit longer, 10.9 versus 8.7. The FSH dose is a bit higher, uh, 2,118 units versus 1,600. For particles greater than 11, uh, th uh, than 11 millimeter, there was 11.7 versus 7.9. Uh, then the COCs, again, no significant difference, 11 versus 11, M2s, 10 versus 8.5, 2PN, 8 versus 7.3, and cle uh, cleavage embryos, 7.9 versus 6.9, and the uh, clinical pregnancy rate per embryo transfer was 61 versus 52. So we can see that at least the clinical uh, results are very uh, satisfactory. So now we can uh, reach our conclusion. Premature LH surges occur in 20% of the cycles if no method for suppression is used. GnRH agonists and antagonists can block LH surge, but, may, but, uh, but LH surges may occur in 2.6% and 16.7% res respectively. So <clears throat> both suppress LH, however, the uh, antagonist induces an immediate suppression. So the cycle is very short, is much shorter. Uh, all the events happen during one menstrual cycle. Whereas with the GnRH agonistic analog, the suppression to be accomplished needs to be much longer, use starting from the luteal phase or the first day of the cycle. And, and of course, uh, also may be associated with cyst formation or estrogen deprivation symptoms. LH surges can also be blocked by progestins, including also micronized and endogenous progestins. So it's synthetic progestins plus micronized natural progesterone and endogenous progesterone. The use of progestins necessitates to freeze all embryos and transfer, <clears throat> again, transfer them in a subsequent cycle because, of course, the endometrium is disturbed with these manipulations. And progestins seem to be associated with similar IVF pregnancy and children outcome rates, as I showed you, based on the existing meta-analysis, 
although we have to say, com compared to the conventional protocols, that the available data so far are not large enough to uh, reach those conclusions with a big uh, degree of co confidence concerning efficacy, but most importantly concerning safety. So yes, they can be done. It's much cheaper to use uh, progestins or to use uh, natural progesterone or the endogenous progesterone even more so. Uh, however, one has to wait for bigger studies uh, to uh, confirm those uh, findings. I would like to finish by thanking my colleagues and collaborators in the first department of obstetrics and gynecology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic talk. Huh? You see in the history from the beginning, the all artificial um, uh, molecules used at all the best that we have tried. And at the end, in the nature, we have already the answer. This is fantastic. We will go for the discussion later on. Then now okay. we will move to the next presentation. Professor Juan Garcia Velasco, which is Chief Medical Officer at, at, in, at Valenciano Institute in Madrid, and is also professor of UBGYN at Rey Juan Carlos University in Madrid, author of more than 200, 300 publications, well, very well known from everybody. Please, Juan Garcia, you have your presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation to be today at this workshop of the International Society for Gynecological Endocrinology. It's a real pleasure to share with you the stage with Professor Basil Terlatsis. And the idea today is to review the new, the new ways of uh, recruiting follicles. Uh, in the residency, in many medical school, we learned that follicular recruitment starts on day two, day three of the follicular phase, early follicular phase days. And today we are all fully aware of, of new strategies to recruit follicles even twice in the same menstrual cycle, like the dual steam protocol, or even at any day, like the so-called random start stimulation protocols that cancer patients uh, use more and more. So we will try to review these new protocols that challenge the dogma of classical conventional ovarian stimulation, try to walk you through the recent literature and, and show you even the most recent randomized controlled trials regarding the, the benefit of these new approaches. If we go back to the early times and we try to understand how follicles are recruited and, and grow, this is a, a beautiful paper that if you have a chance, um, you should read it. It's, a, the, it's an old school paper. If you see, it's 40 years old. It was written by Gary Hodgin, one of the uh, pioneers in, in this field, and he beautifully described how from a cohort of growing follicles in a natural cycle, one of them becomes dominant and the rest of the cohort becomes atrocic. And this natural selection and dominance of the follicle is what we try to rupture when we provide um, gonadotropins or any other medication to induce um, the, the growth of follicles. Uh, as I said, this is a, a long paper. It's uh, things like 15, 20 pages. It's free. You can download it in the in the web of Fertility and Stability. I think it's it's very nice, uh, um, especially at the stage of the career where you are. I think it's very nice to have a look at it and and see how uh, the physiology of the follicular growth is described. But we know today that this is not the only way to grow follicles. Today we know that we can recruit follicles uh, during ovulation time, even in the luteal phase. Uh, there are ways of inducing um, follicular growth in vitro by, by disrupting the, the hypo, uh, hypo signaling. So the classical physiology of recruiting follicles in the early days of the cycle, it's changing. The dogma is being challenged by new ways of, of um, inducing follicular growth. In fact, a uh, hyposignaling pathway that you have here in this graph, uh, it's actually a, um, a several, a, like a collection of, of negative regulators to inactivate uh, hyposignaling. And we can rupture this as, as we know, and they can start growing uh, almost whenever we want. So some of this will depend on, on gonadotropins, and some of them will not depend on gonadotropins, but can be activated by other therapeutic approaches. This actually uh, started to gain popularity when this paper was published in 2003. This is a very interesting experiment 
because sometimes uh, we could see follicles grow at, at the time that we would expect not to grow. So uh, Dr. Barwal in Canada, what she did is actually to do a scan to a group of women every other day. So these are really committed patients that they went to see the gynecologist every other day and they were a scan with a transvaginal probe and they realized that two out of three women have two waves of follicular growth that you can see in the left panel. And one third of these patients had even three waves. They identified three waves. And I think today we all agree that there are actually no truly waves in the follicular growth. You, you could actually activate this follicular growth almost any day. This data was known from years ago from veterinary medicine. And in fact, when you do um, reproduction in, in cattle or in horses or in other species, they always start the stimulation in the luteal phase, something that was never done in humans until very recently. One of the first cases to, to see that the luteal phase was able to recruit follicles was uh, this paper published from uh, these two authors in China. This was a case of a, a patient who was a very poor responder, advanced maternal age, and actually when they went to do the retrieval, the, the patient ovulated, so they couldn't retrieve anything. But instead of canceling the cycle, something that 10 years ago, every one of us would have done, they continued with the stimulation. The patient continued to get the administration of gonotropies in the luteal phase, and they realized that the follicles did grow. So this was the idea that uh, brought Dr. Kwang uh, to generate this, uh, what, what is the so-called Sangai protocol. The Sangai protocol was the first protocol to describe dual steam. It was a, a pretty complex protocol. As you can see, they gave the patient at the beginning of the menstrual cycle clomiphene plus letrozole combined, and then they started HMG. They gave agonist trigger with ibuprofen, and then in the second phase, they gave HMG uh, and, and letrozole, no clomiphene, but then they gave progesterone at the end. So it was a very tricky protocol that this paper could have been rejected because it was a little bit messy, but the concept itself was really original. And this is why RBM Online published it 10 years ago. And it was the beginning of a new concept because they described very clearly that you can have oocyte retrieve in the first follicular uh, phase or in the second retrieval, which is in the luteal phase or, or second uh, follicular wave in the same cycle. If you look at the numbers, it's quite interesting to see how um, the response was even a slightly better, if you look at the p-values here, slightly better in the second wave, in the luteal phase. When you look at the embryos obtained from the first or the second retrieval, um, they are more or less the same. If you look at the numbers of, of uh, implantation and, and pregnancies, they are absolutely comparable. But it was, as I said, a very, a very tricky concept. So um, Filippo Baldi in 2016 simplified this with a, a very straightforward protocol based on this concept that was originally also um, mentioned by Luke Rombots long, long time ago. And this is what he proposed. He proposed a combo protocol with FSH and rec -LH, 300 of rec -FSH, one ampoule or 75 international units of LH, agonist trigger, and then the pickup. And five days later, so you can see one, two, three, four, and the fifth day, they would start again the stimulation of the exactly the same protocol. It was an antagonist-based protocol, agonist trigger pickup. So, the main benefit that they mentioned here is that if you have a poor responder that needs to have more oocytes in, in a, a shorter period of time, this is a nice way to have two pickups in a month. When you analyze the, the embryos obtained, they were doing PGTA, and they realized that 41% of these patients had Euclid embryos in the first attempt, 53% had Euclid embryos in the second uh, pickup, and altogether, almost 70% had Euclid embryos. So if you compare one pickup, 41% versus 70% in two pickups, you can increase the number of Euclid embryos by just doing one more uh, retrieval in, in, in the second phase. Actually, when, when they compare the idea of doing two different conventional ovary stimulations versus dual stim, this approach of doing two pickups in a month. In green, you can see the women who had a baby. It's clearly superior in the dual stim group. Uh, it's uh, um, impressive the number of dropouts. So women who did one pickup and after failing with no baby, 
they just abandoned the treatment about 90 percent and if you look at the cumulative life birth rate it was a double it was twice as, as high in the dual steam versus the the single stimulation this is retrospective data published last year in 2022 if we again look at the time between first and second retrievals women doing dual steam it was extremely fast if you do one stimulation and if you fail then you consider a second stimulation the the time between first and second was significantly longer because obviously there is some time to think about it and to consider or reconsider a new cycle if you look at women with babies as, as you can see in blue more babies in the dual steam group and especially women who had um, two babies you could see um, either two babies or, or two blastocysts available for transfer significantly better outcome when you did do a stem. As usual, when, when new studies come out, there's always uh, people who meta-analyze the evidence, how strong is the evidence. And if you look at the number of oocytes obtained in the luteal phase versus uh, follicular phase, it seems that uh, the trend favors the luteal phase stimulation. It seems that when you stimulate in the second phase, you either have the same response than in the first stimulation or slightly better. If you look at this meta-analysis, Forest plot is it doesn't cross the unity here, so it's clearly significant. When uh, you look again at the uh, dual steam approach in in patients and that fulfill the Bologna criteria, it's an interesting exercise. What uh, Viarelli from the group of Filippo Baldi did, and again they they compare patients who did a one conventional brain stimulation versus uh, patients who chose to do dual steam, and if you look at the cumulative live birth it's significantly higher, 15 versus 8% in, in women who did um, do a stem. If you look at the number of patients who were transferred uterine embryos, again, uh, significantly better in the dual stem group, and the patients who, who abandon after a failed attempt is obviously much lower because here you compromise with the patient that usually they are poor responders to increase the number of oocytes from which you will start doing the IVF and the PETA. So obviously you will have more oocytes that will make blastocysts and obviously will make babies. Again, retrospective data. What we do at uh, EV Madrid since 2018, we started this protocol, a very simplistic uh, approach similar to Filippo's using 225 international units of, of uh, gonadotropins in an antagonist based uh, protocol, we do uh, ovum pickup, uh, vitrification of the oocytes. We don't make embryos in the first attempt because it's cheaper for the patient to freeze the eggs. And then we will make one ICSI cycle combining fresh and frozen and one PETA cycle combining fresh and frozen. So it's significantly uh, more e efficient for the patient. After five days, we start exactly with the same protocol, antagonist-based protocol and and ICSI. we could discuss about the need of using the antagonist here because most of these women in the second phase will have high progesterone levels but that's something for the discussion later we initially um, published this uh, preliminary data with uh, our friends from brazil with uh, gustavo sequino and a few others these were difficult patients as you see mini age is around 38 39 with a uh, um, low number of, of follicle count with low amh and uh, most of them had between two to three previous IVF cycle, phase cycles. So this was still preliminary data, but we can see that the, the outcome was more or less the same. If you look at the number of, of um, days of stimulation, it's a slightly longer. Always the luteal phase stimulation usually tends to, to need one more day as, as a mean. But uh, obviously one more day means a slightly higher dose of gonadotropins. But if you look at the number of oocytes, again, this time was significant and you have more oocytes in the luteal phase stimulation and more mature oocytes. The maturity rate was exactly the same, similar to fertilization rate, blastulation rate, and the blastocyst per cycle. So again, similar outcome, slightly better response, uh, slightly longer duration of the stimulation. And again, this is retrospective data. So uh, prospective uh, trials, they're not very abundant in the literature. Uh, we actually published at the end of last year, um, a few months ago, this paper with Maria Cerrillo from our group, which we randomized in a small uh, study uh, patients to undergo um, dual steam or do just the conventional stimulation. Again, women close to the 40s uh, with low AMH under one nanogram, uh, low antrophotical count, normal BMI. And again, if you look at the outcome of these patients, whether you are controls or whether they are dual steam, 
the outcome is is very very similar the thing is that when you go into the into the duostim protocol you will have more embryos available more embryos uh, available for uh, PETA and the, and the main significant difference here you can see in the table all of these things are more or less the same um, but if you look at the time to find the euclid embryo it's almost almost a month before so in these women at, at the late 30s early 40s where every month counts uh, instead of waiting for another month if they fail and doing another cycle which is going to be more expensive we can reduce the cost and we can reduce the the time waiting to find this euclid embryo that may give them the chance to have a baby and we always talk about dual steam but why not triple or quadruple these women that only produce two or three oocytes you can do a dual steam and you still are in the low range of number of oocytes why not doing a, a third or even a fourth stimulation one after the other and, and we have done that already we haven't published the results yet but we have a women who did two or three four even five or six uh, but five or six obviously is very uncommon but women who did uh, two or three or even four is not that uncommon anymore and we were wondering if there were more Euclid embryos in the first or the second rather than the third or the fourth and, and we realized that the uh, chances of finding an Euclid embryo is exactly the same whether it, it comes from the first stimulation or from the third stimulation as you can see in this graph about one in four embryos going to be euploid in this at, at this age and it really doesn't make a difference the only thing of doing this approach is that you will find this euploid embryo probably faster finally if you try to understand the um, perinatal outcome of this um, of these babies uh, slowly the evidence is being built and again the group of uh, Bayarelli and Filippo Baldi published not long ago uh, one of the first largest series in women who had embryo transfer 182 uh, were embryos coming from the follicular phase stimulation 207 from the luteal phase stimulation again if you look at the age of these italian patients is similar to ours in spain 38.9 years they had a, a similar pregnancy rate in both follicular or luteal phase um, embryos biochemical pregnancy loss and miscarriage rate so at the end the life birth rate was comparable whether the embryos came from the first or from the second stimulation the the odds ratio you can see crosses the unity so it's not significant it means that they are comparable and when you look at the low birth weight or the large for gestational age or even preterm birth there were no differences among groups uh, obviously we we need more data this is the larger study up to date but it confirms that the ovarian stimulation can be started at any point in the cycle including the luteal phase thank you very much thank you thank you also to the presentation of Juan. Garcia Velasco, now is the moment of question and discussion. And then I suggest from our participant to write their question. And I would like, first of all, to have a comment from Basil. Uh, the comment is that one, you know, when we started, we were absolutely not aware with that, that idea that during luteal phase, we cannot have any other pregnancy, that the luteal phase is a protection for the woman to uh, maintain the single single fertilized egg strategy that we have in humans. Now it's clear that something is the fertilization and, some, and the maturation, but something is the possibility to achieve uh, follicles who can be artificially stimulated in absence of LH by the FSH. And then, I, and then also uh, this can be achieved also in presence of endogenous progesterone. And then you have made a study where you have tried the efficiency of endogenous progesterone to avoid LH surge. And I would like to, I need to have, a, uh, you know, at, the, uh, at that point, uh, uh, your view, your personal consideration about what we are facing now, what in our strategy have to be done according to the patient who came to us. We have the young patient, we have the medium fertility age patient, we have the advanced fertility age patient coming. And what is your strategy, Basil, in, this, uh, in the different individuals? I think, Andre, I think we, we need to differentiate what is happening, what has been the um, uh, physiological sequence of events uh, in a natural cycle aiming at monofollicular development and also a monoocyte 
uh, development, and finally, a pregnancy <clears throat> eventually uh, with one embryo, uh, versus the, 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 the use of the multiple waves that uh, both uh, Juan and I showed uh, that give us the opportunity to collect more oocytes. So if we, if we try to categorize, I would say that in women who are uh, anticipated high responders or good responders, and they are uh, also in a good reproductive age, I think we do not usually need to go into dual steam or three times steam and so on, because in one uh, normal uh, uh, um, stimulated cycle, we can get 12, 14, 15 oocytes, which is enough for the woman to both have a fresh embryo transfer or have and ha and then have multiple frozen thawed embryo transfers, or to have a freeze all and then again multiple embryo transfers. A second category is the category of women who need to undergo uh, ovarian uh, uh, stimulation and pickup urgently because for medical reasons, for example, uh, cancers. Usually, we talk about breast cancers. So in these cases, it's a matter of time. So our aim is to be able to collect as many oocytes as possible from this woman before she starts chemotherapy. That's an important group and we have to be aware and also we have to collaborate with our colleagues, um, the oncologists, uh, uh, in order to determine number one, what is the time frame that we have at our disposal. How many days do we have? How many weeks we have before they need to start their treatment? Yes. And in this particular case, we may decide to do a dual stim using obviously uh, FSH plus uh, letrozole in order to avoid excessive um, estrogen production and protect the breast and then manage to collect uh, uh, as many oocytes as possible in the shortest uh, possible period of time. A third condition that uh, Juan uh, uh, Garcia developed is the, women, the poor responders. There we need studies to confirm that indeed we are able to get uh, uh, significantly more oocytes. That's what it seems, but it needs to be proven. And therefore that this is worthwhile to be done. Uh, uh, I think we need more data to see how many uh, more oocytes can we get and at the, ultimately what is the pregnancy rate, whether we indeed gain pregnancies. In theory, it seems to be promising because yes, in one cycle or even two cycles, if you go into third and fourth uh, stimulation uh, within two months, uh, uh, the question is again to see how many of them will be, yes. uh, how many sites more we get. So I think it's interesting, it's promising, and we need to move carefully uh, uh, and collect data. Okay, then we have a series of uh, questions coming from the floor. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, one is uh, from our friend Tevfik Yoldemir. He asks uh, question one. How do you start a late follicular stimulation? Straightforward? Do you need to add in a progestin or not? Well, I think what the study showed is that you can start it uh, four or five days after ovulation, uh, spontaneous ovulation, let's say, and, and so that progesterone has uh, endogenous progesterone has already uh, risen, and then use the suppressive effect of the endogenous progesterone without a need to use exogenous uh, additional progesterone. So that's what you could do and then you can, you can have a pickup uh, uh, accordingly. And then, uh, then another question from Jaron Goichmann. During stimulation, do you test progesterone level and at the, what level do you stop the stimulation? Uh, I think we can, we can test progesterone to make sure that progesterone has risen. Uh, and in, in the, if this is the case, then we continue, we, the stimulation continues until we have uh, uh, follicular development. 
uh, and we can have the pickup. If the, if the ovaries do not respond, then obviously uh, we don't need to keep stimulating because uh, it, it obviously doesn't work. But if the patient responds and we see on ultrasound that there are follicles growing in the luteal phase, then we will continue until those follicles get at around 16, 17, 18 millimeters, and then, then we would do the pickup. Thank you. And then, you know, <clears throat> many questions. Eh? And then from another anonymous, is there any criteria before doing the luteal phase stimulation, such uh, the amount uh, of follicle antral count after the first ovarian pickup, ovarian puncture? Well, I think that since we are still in the exploratory phase, as we saw from the data that uh, uh, Juan showed, uh, uh, they do it in poor responders, who by definition have, have very few follicles. So what they do is they try, even if you see one antral follicle count, they, they, they try to get a second in the luteal phase in order to have two, let's say, or three oocytes instead of having just one. So I think until we need, as, a, as, as uh, Juan said, and, and I also repeated, that we need to continue and do the right studies in order to, un uh, to answer those uh, very uh, reasonable and pertinent questions, uh, whether indeed we manage to get more and whether it is worthwhile of doing all the efforts. Thank you. And then Ngok Minchao asks, would you please point out the criteria to choose the inhibit early alert search protocol with progesterone or GnRH antagonist? I don't think that there are any criteria indicating so far. The only the studies have shown that both are equally effective. So I don't think that we have so far criteria saying that this particular patient should have progesterone uh, or progestogen and the other one should have the antagonist. Uh, I think the the choice uh, the, the discussion is primarily done based on cost. So clearly the use of the uh, the use of um, uh, progestins is cheaper than the use of the antagonists. So yeah. if if cost is an issue, I mean is an issue because it's not covered by insurance, then uh, that could be. And, and another uh, indication clearly, again, related to cost is for don outside donors. So again, in this case, uh, clearly, and some people I think are doing it quite routinely in outside donors to use uh, progestins, uh, which reduces the cost uh, for the uh, for the patient for the uh, recipient. This is very very important. The problem of the cost is touching. You know, the economy in general <laughs> is under pressure now everywhere yeah. in the world. And we have a, we have a, a a question also from another anonymous during doing the uh, progesterone um, the progesterone inhibition uh -huh, how many percent of the LH surge still can happen um yeah i think i think it's it it can happen but it's quite low i don't remember now the numbers but the the uh, in some of the, i think i showed it uh, the incidence was low yes and then from yaron goichmann have you been using uh, at a player protocol for stimulation of flow responders? And have you seen better responses with this protocol? Which protocol? Oh, he, he wrote using a flyer protocol. Uh, probably it's a mistake. I don't, I don't. No, I don't understand because it's probably... Uh, what, it's I, probably what I showed is using pro progestins in yes. full response, and there was no difference practically. And then also another question from Tefik Yoldemir. What criteria are used to define this idea, the low ovarian reserve and offer egg freezing? Okay, that's that's a good but difficult question. Now, the only the only uh, uh, validated criteria so far are the Bologna criteria. Uh, there have also been the so-called Poseidon criteria as well. Uh, so uh, it is important to identify, but empirically speaking, uh, the, uh, you, the, the uh, either 
using uh, the markers like AMH. Uh, the question is if you have low AMH or if you have low un, um, uh, and, uh, antral follicle count, uh, these are criteria, or if you have a previous uh, poor ovarian response, which means a reduced number of follicles developed, uh, all these are criteria that are taking into account in the Bologna criteria, and yes. also the woman's age. Uh, yes. Now, in the Poseidon criteria, they try to identify women who are younger and and, and, and uh, present with these problems. But again, it's a, a little bit more uh, complicated there. So it's good to use some uh, criteria for identifying the so-called low responders. And usually what is used is the low number of oocytes of, of follicles developed and low number of oocytes retrieved and the, uh, and the uh, low uh, levels of uh, AMH and uh, a reduced number of antral follicles. Yes, and also another anonymous, he make a question that please, if you can repeat what it was the dose of gonadotropin that you use in the dual stimulation cycle. And uh, in that, uh, do you prefer to go to minimal or high dose to have, uh, to get more follicles? Well, uh, co concerning concerning the, uh, the dose, I think the dose that, um, uh, that uh, Filippo Baldi and, uh, and uh, Juan are using are about 225 or 250 yes. in normal responders. But I think also in the, in the uh, high, in the low responders, they, you cannot, that doesn't seem to be an advantage going into uh, gigantic doses. Now in poor responders, there have been a few papers, Bart Fauser <clears throat> and others, who have shown that maybe in, in uh, poor responders, uh, uh, low dose might be equally effective. And especially, you know, if, if for example, uh, the, uh, you are gonna get one or two oocytes anyway, uh, uh, there is no need to give 300 and 400 because you, you are not gonna get many more. So maybe you can do it with a lower dose or even you can do it with a combination of letrozole and FSH. Uh, especially when FSH is already elevated. So if it is a bit elevated, what's the point in adding a few more FSH? So that's why trying another mechanism with letrozole might help and has been shown in some studies to help. Yes, yes. always again, Gok Min Chao is asking, why do, do we have to start progesting early at the time of ovarian stimulation? Can we start later in cycle when oocyte is more or equal of uh, 12 or 12 when oocyte more or equal of 12 millimeter appears? It's always well. I think I think yeah. Please. I think it is uh, this. This question is similar to the um, uh, uh, to the um, uh, use of the antagonist, whether it should be fixed or flexible. Now, again, it has been shown that going for the flexible, you, you have the risk that LH may rise before you, you have started uh, uh, the antagonist administration. And I'm afraid that this could also be the same with the uh, progesterone because you start the, or the progesterone, you start the progesterone, but un until you have some levels that would suppress LH, you may risk having an LH surge. So it might be a bit, uh, a bit more um, uh, reliable to start earlier in the cycle. Uh, I think like Filippo has been using, starting from the beginning, giving the progestins, it might be safer to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, uh, LH surges that might occur uh, before you start the progestins at a later stage. Yes, then, okay, then we are, Approaching to the end. First of all, I would like to thank you, eh, Basil. You are a master, a master. And uh, you are also the, the image of what happened in these last 20, 30 years. You remember since when Bob Edwards started, we have no freezing, we have no possibility of also the proper treatment, we have no the antagonist, nothing at that, and he succeeded. Now we are approaching to be more closer to the physiology, to the normal physiology. Yeah. Also, the possibility of uh, freezing is have absolutely enriched 
our, our clinical activity. And then I would like to have from you a final comment of this fantastic webinar for the ASG, a final comment on how you, how you look now the uh, clinical aspects of IVF and the request, growing request of always older people, growing request of younger, but with pathological conditions, we were um, dramatically touching their life. And uh, also the problem of people who start uh, looking for a pregnancy, but in absence of a partner. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, all these issues are, of course, very important and challenging. Yes. Uh, so, uh, you I are that... no. <laughs> so I think we, are, we have reached a stage that we understand much better. Because as you rightly pointed out, uh, in the beginning, we knew practically nothing. So whatever we observed uh, every day in the lab, it was new and we could publish it. Uh, now we have reached a point that we have learned a lot about the physiology uh, of uh, follicular genesis, of all genesis, but still there are things that we need to know. For example, we know now and has been documented with the help of uh, pre-implantation genetic uh, uh, testing for aneuploidies, that uh, yes, uh, there is a, a, a gradual rise of aneuploidies with age. So we know that now. And there, I think there, is, there might be a big help using the technology to, to identify which oocytes are normal so that we transfer normal, uh, uh, karyotypically normal oocytes. However, it is quite likely that there are other factors apart from the genetics that we know in the oocyte, in the ooplasm or in the mitochondria. And these factors uh, may, uh, you know, which change with age as well, may also affect the yes. chance of implantation. So we may have, to, we need to, to understand more about uh, the changes that take place in the oocyte during aging, so that perhaps we can stop this process or we can reverse this process. And, 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 and so we can have all sites that will be able to, will be chromosomically, no, chromosomally normal and from all the other physiological functions also normal so that they can implant and lead to a pregnancy. On, uh, on the other hand, concerning, concerning stimulation, yes, we are, there is a lot of discussion. I think Frizol has been a very, very important step forward because now we can have, um, uh, we can have the uh, uh, comfort of stimulating without the anxiety of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And those of us who are a bit older remember in the 80s and in the 90s that we had women with terrible OHSS syndrome in the hospitals with uh, paracenti abdominal paracentesis, emptying liters of fluid, and next day, again, uh, liters of fluid accumulated. So all these things today seem something of the very uh, long past, but uh, we need to understand better stimulation so uh, that we can have all sites enough for the woman who can have with one successful pickup can have uh, I have patients who had three children from one original pickup. So I think that that's something that we all we, is owed to the, uh, to the vitrification, uh, uh, to the vitrification technique, which al allows a high degree of um, uh, survival after thawing and high degree of implantation and pregnancy accomplishment. So, that's good. And then finally, concerning uh, couples without, so without partners, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is something which is increasing because all of us in our societies uh, are deferring uh, uh, pregnancy well over 30, whereas our grandmothers were having their children between 20 and 30. Now it is well about 30 and has got even closer to 40. So in that case, again, vitrification helps because we can have oocyte freezing. 
so that we can stop time for those oocytes and women may have a, a uh, when they have a partner or they, or they feel ready, they can use them. So that has been a big advantage as well. And, 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 and of course, we have to educate. I think that's big and there are many initiatives from different organizations, including WHO, but not only um, ESRE, IFFS, ASRM, uh, to educate women about physiology, which so far we have not been able to change. Physiology has its own, uh, you know, tempo, and it goes on. So they have to know that and make, uh, you know, their agenda, life uh, agenda of their life, prioritize things. Yes. And and as I said today, they have the option of oocyte freezing as younger as possible, so that they can have it as a deposit. Maybe they will never use it because they will find a partner early enough and then they don't need it. It's fine. It's like, you know, doing a life insurance. It's good that you never use it. I mean, yes. uh, but it's still there. So, so, yes. I, so I think, I think that we reached a very, we have done a lot of progress and we have reached a very good stage, but of course there are lots of things more to learn and do. Thank you, thank you, Basil. And it was a pleasure to be with you today. It's a pleasure to be your friend since 30 and even more years and to have seen together with you how the world is changing surrounding ourselves, how our knowledge is growing, but also still, how much still we have to learn, how much still we have to go on to make better the quality of living of our women, of ourselves, and of our families. And we thank, thank you, grazie mille, thank you, Basil, since all thank the ASG people. <laughs> and then I thank also Juan Garcia Velasco. And uh, we will, uh, I will invite now you to the next, uh, next uh, webinar, which will be on premature ovarian insufficiency, yeah. improving diagnostic and treatment. And we will have two stars, uh, that time, the gender will be both feminine, Professor Angelica Linden Hirschberg from Stockholm and Professor Svetlana Vujovic from Belgrade. It will be the 21st of June at three o'clock Central European time. Thank you, thank you, Basil. And then to all of you, I invite all of you next year in May, we will have a fantastic meeting in Florence again of the World Congress of Gynecological Endocrinology. We will be all there. <laughs> Basil, thank you again. Thank you to your family. Take care for your hand thank and you, all, you. all the regards to all. And since the people of the ISGE, thank you. Thank you again. Goodbye. Goodbye. Have a good day.